welcome to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So Reed, today we are going to bring the audience, introduce them to Major Joseph Strabley. He is a logistics readiness officer. And I want to say here, this career field that he's going to cover for us, the LRO 21 Romeo Logistics Readiness, this has been one of the more requested career fields since we've been doing this podcast, especially in the last year. And I don't know if it's just coincidence or if it's because of what we have seen play out in Russia and Ukraine that logistics has been kind of brought up to the forefront or maybe had something to do with COVID and the impacts to the logistics supply chain. But it seems to me that people are starting to be a little bit more aware of this massively important career field that exists in the background to everything that we do. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective because I think, like you said, people have been interacting with logistics or lack thereof quite a bit more in their lives post-COVID, certainly. But yeah, for me, Colin, I learned a ton in this. Mm -hmm. I'm a you know war operations guy. I don't think about support enough. And so I really gained a lot from this. And I think our audience will too. And I'm excited to bring this interview to them today. Yeah, this is a really unique experience for the audience to hear from Joe, from Major Strabley, because obviously we haven't covered this career field before, but he comes at it from a very interesting and unique background that I think is going to be really useful. Not to give it all away, but he is a guard officer filling an active duty role at the moment at a higher level headquarters. It's not that that's not normal. It's just that kind of like logistics as a whole, you just don't hear about that very often. And so without further ado, let's turn it over to Major Joe Strabley and the logistics readiness career field. All right. So here on... The podcast today, we have Major Joseph Strabley calling in from Germany. Is that correct? That's correct. You say VA4. Okay. You're at the staff. We'll get into that a little bit. That's exciting. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, staff work is both great and terrible all at the same time, right? Absolutely. I take it you've done something in your, uh, your past. <laughs> I personally have never worked on a staff, but as an officer, and as I'm sure we'll get into as we do your interview here, is that staff plays a really important role in what we do as officers. And it behooves us to know who is on your staff, you know, essentially saying like who is on your team, who is up in the play box, you know, trying to make things happen down on the field. And so I've worked really closely with different staffs, A4, A7, those kinds of things. Maybe we'll get into what the different numbers mean and all that. But no, I personally have never actually been on a staff. And, you know, I would say I count myself as lucky so far in that regard. But I also know that if I want to continue my development as an officer, that's something I'm going to have to do sometime in the future, right? Absolutely. It can be a double-edged sword. For, well, yeah, so many things are in the Air Force. Let's pause the discussion about that for the moment. Let's get to know Major Joe Strabley for a little bit. Give us an idea of who you are, where you came from, what brought you into the Air Force, what you've been doing up to this point, you know, what you've done for your career. And then we'll start getting more into what you're doing right now for the Air Force as we discuss the logistics readiness career field. Sounds like a plan. Well, to tell you guys a little bit more about myself, I come from a small town, kind of a speck on the map out in the middle of a cornfield in Illinois. There's not a whole lot there. Central Illinois, I was actually prior enlisted. I enlisted straight out of high school. I ended up leaving for basic training just a few weeks after I turned 18. Okay. At the time, I didn't want to go to college. I was burnt out on high school, had zero desire to go to college at the time, but I knew I wanted to get out and see the world. And my dad actually served a few years in the Air Force. He did one enlistment back in the 70s before I was born. So 
kind of had a, a little bit of an insight as to what it was like, at least at that time. So it sounded like a good option. I talked to a recruiter and did delayed entry for a good 10 months to a year-ish before pulling chocks and heading out. I don't know that we've discussed on this podcast in any detail what delayed entry means. Can you give the audience an idea of what that program is? Absolutely. Uh, delayed entry, also called DEP, it is exactly how it sounds. Basically, you sign the paperwork to go, but you don't actually leave for basic training until a later date. Pretty common amongst high school kids that are getting ready to leave. You want to sign up the paperwork, get your basic training date, uh, be able to select your job and not have to rush after you graduate high school. So it's a good option for high school kids mostly, but it applies to anybody else that's looking to join. Is the delayed enlistment program something that officers do? I believe so. I'm not 100% sure on that, though. It's not the uh, path that I took, so it's not what I'm familiar with. Reed may need to correct me on this, but I believe that he did the delayed enlistment program prior to his going to officer training school. So I do think it is possible. I'm not familiar with exactly how it works. Reed may provide a little bit more detail on that for anybody who might be interested. So so you did the delayed enlistment program. You finally made it in 10 months later. Where'd you go from that point? Well, it was off to a basic training at Lackland. After that, I was uh, my career field was POL. That stands for Petroleum, Oils, and Lubricants. It's the uh, fuels guys, the ones that are responsible for putting fuel on the planes. Uh-huh. So I did that for a total of four and a half years where I was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada and Anderson Air Force Base, Guam, with some deployments and other TDYs in between. After that, I ended up actually completely separating from the Air Force. I wanted to go back to college. I got the itch to get my education. We were awfully busy at that time. This was around 2003. So as you can probably imagine, we were still in high ops tempos uh, for after 9-11. Yeah. So the college wasn't happening while working 12-hour shifts. So I ended up separating. I went to college, got my degree from Southern Illinois University, and I actually enlisted again back into the Guard. So, oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'm actually a uh, TFI partner. <laughs> yes. Could not get enough. I'm a TFI. I'm a Guard guy over here. But yes, I missed it. I wanted to come back. I enlisted back into POL, and I did that for about six years before earning a commission as a logistics officer. Okay, so you're using the acronym TFI. Can you explain what that is? Total Force Integration, yes. That is our active duty, Air Guard, as well as reservists uh, combined. It's uh, one mission, one fight. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing, and certainly one that we have not had the opportunity to explore here on the podcast. So not only are you on staff, You are in Germany, but you're also a guard guy. You're an officer in the Air National Guard outside of the States doing an OCONUS mission. Absolutely. It's a little bit different of a combination is what uh, you would expect when you hear of officers up on staff, but it is an option for us. We're able to get on like temporary duty tours ranging from six months up to a few years over here supporting you safety staff. And we basically fill staff positions as the... Theater has grown over the years. We actually support both USAFE as well as AF Africa. So there's a lot of responsibility that we're covering there. And our active duty partners don't have the manning to cover all of that. So they're able to tap into the guard and the reserve to come over and help out. So that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's really cool. Probably one of the more lesser known opportunities in the Air Force. You know, so many people think that you know, coming in that if they're going to travel, they have to be on active duty and they're going to hope and pray and beg, borrow and steal their way into some of the more, quote, exotic locations. And I don't think that people realize that if you join the Guard or the Reserve, you can literally go anywhere, right? Absolutely. Your mileage may vary depending on what it is that you're doing for the Air Force, you know, the specific career field that you're in, where you're at in your career in terms of development and, you know, what the ops tempo looks like, what the money situation looks like. But don't think that if you are planning to join the Guard or Reserve that you're stuck at that one base in that one location, that that one unit for the rest of your career, right? 100%. That point cannot be stated enough. There are options. It's sometimes they're tricky to find. You have to know where to look, but they are out there. Yeah. Okay. So you studied at Southern Illinois. What was it that you studied? 
Economics. I ended up majoring in economics. I went there with the intention of going into respiratory therapy. They ended up shutting down the program, actually, while I was working on my generals to knock that out. Okay. So I bounced around majors a couple of times and ended up landing on economics. What was it that drew you to economics? Why did you finally decide that? Well, after bouncing around majors for so long, it was something I think I could finish up quickly and get out of the classroom. (laughs) But other than that, uh, the finance aspect of it interested me at the time. I I thought that was something that I'd be able to take anywhere. It wasn't necessarily a business degree, but it was business related enough to get my foot in the door anywhere I wanted to go. Yeah. And sometimes that's really all you need is just, you know, a key to unlock the doors. And as we'll discuss here and as we have explored many times you know, throughout this podcast is that what you study for your degree is not necessarily what you're going to do for the Air Force. We're looking for people who know how to study, people who know how to you know, do research, consolidate an argument, communicate your position, communicate a vision. And more than anything, really, is just like be able to you know, stick with it, you know, have some grit over the long haul. And we have made no effort in concealing that we feel that the bachelor's degree should go away as a requirement for Air Force officers. But if it is to remain, that is the reason why it should. That is what we're looking for is it provides some ability for Air Force officers to know how to problem solve, know how to communicate and know how to do something difficult for a long time. Absolutely. 100%. The degree does not necessarily dictate the job unless you're going into something like civil engineering. A lot of times they want somebody with an engineering background or comm. They would need somebody with a computer type background, but it's mostly those STEM specific career fields. Otherwise, as you said, they're looking for somebody that can lead and problem solve. Right. Absolutely. So you got your degree. What was the process then from you graduating with your bachelor's degree, you're already enlisted into the Air National Guard. How did you then make that transition from E to O? Well, in the Guard, it works a little bit differently because what I was doing is I was applying within my own wing. So I'm already a part of the wing. Uh, You basically have to wait for there to be an opening. It's not like open recruitment for officers like it can be on active duty. It's more of selective. If they have a slot available, they announce it, you apply and go forth and conquer. So I was in uh, POL, which was a part of the uh, logistics readiness squadron. This was a position within my squadron. So after six years of showing what I'm capable of, I think my, uh, my commander at the time had faith and ended up selecting me. So that was the uh, selection process. And then from that point, it was off to OTS. Now, that selection process, was this you just like talking to your immediate supervisor, talking to the senior enlisted leader, talking to your commander saying, hey, I'm interested in being an officer and that was it? Or was there a board? Was there like, did you have to pull your records together and submit them? Like walk us through what that looked like for you to give us an idea of what it might look like elsewhere in the guard. Absolutely. So that initial conversation is the uh, jumping off point. But then after that, once the position was announced, the position announcement had all of the details that were required for the package. It was uh, just basically all of my records, personnel records, fitness records, et cetera, and package that up, submit it up to uh, FSS, and they take it from there. And once they comb through all the packages, determine who all is eligible, who meets the requirements and who does not, they weed them out that way. If selected, you end up going up for a board. So it is full dress blues, three officers. My group commander at the time was the uh, board president. So it was an 06, an 05, and then an 03 on the board. Okay. So a little nerve wracking for a a staff sergeant at at the time, young staff sergeant. But yeah, I went in there and the board lasted probably about 30 to 45 minutes of just getting grilled with questions. I think they're... Trying to determine once again, can you think on your feet and uh, how would you lead? How would you problem solve? And they get a good feel for that within the board process. So after that, they end up uh, racking and stacking according to the board selection. They have their first, second, third place choice and they notify the winner. And once the selectee accepts, then the medical, physical and setting up the OTS dates are processed. Okay. Now, is that process that you went through, is that specific to your wing or have you seen 
that kind of similarly play out elsewhere in the guard. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to participate in that type of thing, or if you know others who have, is that a pretty common way of selecting officers within the air guard? That is pretty standard across the board. I have been on the other side of the table and it's much less nerve wracking on that side as opposed <laughs> to when you're, when you're actually getting grilled. But yes, that is from what I've talked to from other units, that's pretty standard across the board. They make the announcement Sometimes it's nationwide. So just because you're in a specific unit doesn't mean that you can only apply for positions in that unit. You can go outside of the unit if they have vacancies. And a lot of people actually do that. But it just so happened for myself, it worked out within my own unit. Yeah. And so that's how you actually ended up as an LRO is that you were already in a logistics readiness squadron. There was an opening within that squadron. That's the one that you applied for and were selected for. Ergo, you became a logistics readiness officer, right? Exactly. The stars aligned. Okay. And we don't need to belabor this process anymore, but I think it's been very useful, especially because we haven't had a chance to cover it here on the podcast of how someone who is in the guard commissions into the guard. I'm not personally familiar with it. I'm a reservist. Reed is on active duty. And so that's a world that we're not totally familiar with. We don't need to talk about OTS. We expect that you completed it just fine. Here you are many years later still serving. And so I will assume that all went well, but let's start talking a little bit more about your career as a uh, logistics readiness officer, or, or do you prefer to go by LRO? Is that how you identify your career field? Yes. Yes, we do go by LRO. That's the, uh, the common vernacular amongst the community. Logistics readiness is kind of a, a mouthful, right? So where have you been so far? Where has logistics taken you? Obviously, the Guard, have you had other opportunities to do orders elsewhere? What does that look like up to this point? So up to this point, yes, my home station was at uh, Scott Air Force Base. That's where my unit is based out of. I've been with the same unit uh, my whole Guard career, at least, not counting my prior active duty. Okay. But uh, being an LRO has taken me, yeah, quite a few places. I've been to Germany, obviously, that's where I'm at right now. Japan, Hawaii, Alaska, all over the Yusefi Theater, a lot of the Eastern European countries, Kuwait, Qatar, kind of all around the world. I've hit quite a few areas of responsibility as an LRO. Logistics is needed all over the globe. You need to be able to move people and assets, and you need people in place to do that. Now, have all of those different locations, were those for deployments? Were you doing that in support of operations? Was it training? Was it for just brief stints, you know, a couple of weeks here and there? Was it long deployments? What was that like? So Kuwait and Qatar were both deployments. Actually, I was deployed to Qatar. I worked under A5, kind of another staff job in the coalition cell. So basically I was a liaison officer or LNO for the 17 or so coalition nations that were out at LUD and ended up getting forward deployed to Kuwait to work in their operations center. And that was for deployment to backfill somebody else that had gone home. His wife was pregnant before he deployed. They were able to cut him him some slack and send him home a little bit early to witness the birth of his child. So they needed a little bit of backfill. (laughs) Yeah. And that was a little bit, um, it was interesting. It was definitely not a typical LRO tasking. It's uh, typically like a rated pilot slot, but it's not necessarily required to be a flyer to, you know, help navigate like airspace issues within the country of Kuwait. So other than that, most of the other places were a couple of weeks here, a couple of weeks there for training. And my current position here at the USAFE staff is chief of expeditionary site surveys. So any O plan that we support or any type of deployment that our units here within USAFE are going out to, they need to know what's on the ground. They need to know what the capabilities are. They're getting ready to go out the door. What do they need to bring with versus what can host nation provide? So my job is to assemble a team of about 25 subject matter experts. We go to these various airfields throughout the AOR and make an assessment of what's there. So we're talking everything from the airfield to defects and lodging, fuel systems and storage capabilities, aerial ports, looking at their vehicles, pretty much running the entire gamut of what is available at that base. We keep it in the repository and then anytime a unit is getting ready to deploy or We have to uh, assess what capabilities they have. The site surveys are the first place that we go to. So a lot of these TDYs I've been on have been through site surveys. Yeah, that's a really interesting capability that I don't know people are very familiar with. The fact that the Air Force, yes, we can get anywhere in the world within 24 hours. 
but we have to have some place to go to, right? <laughs> exactly. You have to know if you can land there. You have to know if you can refuel and where you're going to eat and sleep. Yeah, really important things that greatly affect our ability to continue operations downrange. And so that's a really cool opportunity. Is this position that you're doing typically a guard position or are you just supplementing the active duty staff because numbers, right? Yes, it's not a guard position. Basically, it is a logistics future ops position and I happen to be in that office. So they needed somebody to fill it. I got here at the right time. Awesome. So I think therein is a really good place for us to transition fully into the exploration of the 21 Romeo logistics readiness officer career field. Let's have you give the audience an idea of more broadly, more big picture, what the career field is for. Who is the LRO? Why did they exist? What are the things that they bring to the Air Force? Let's try to understand how critical this position is to Air Force operations. Absolutely. Well, for any type of Air Force operation, logistics is incredibly important. You have to have, you have to be able to get your people to the right spot at the right time. You have support assets there, as well as anything required to fix the aircraft or support the aircraft. So logistics readiness officers, LROs, we basically lead the people that are making that happen. We have six different enlisted AFSCs within a typical LRS squadron. So the day-to-day -day operations of an LRO can completely vary. We have everything from fuels to our traffic management, aerial ports, supply, logistics plans, as well as vehicle management. So we're pretty much hands-on with everything support-related. So I think the running joke of our tech school training was that we're the jack of all trades, master of none. Our training is a mile wide and an inch deep. <laughs> it's not possible to teach one person all of those AFSCs and expect them to be an expert at any of them. So we just kind of need to know enough about it to speak intelligently about it and be able to make decisions when decisions need to be made. So the typical day in the life of an LRO could be completely different depending on what section you're over, what flight you're over, as well as what unit you actually belong to, what the mission set of that unit is. So for example, what you do for an LRO is going to be slightly different for a fighter wing as opposed to a missile wing. Absolutely. Those are going to be completely different mission sets and heavy aircraft as well would be another completely different mission set. For example, you would not have a full-blown aerial port, which is the passenger terminal, as well as where the cargo is loaded on the plane at, say, a fighter or a missile wing, you wouldn't have the need for that capability. Right. But if you're at a C-17 unit, that is your bread and butter. So that is, yeah, what you're going to be doing all the time, right? Absolutely. Completely. So as the mission set changes, so does your area of responsibility. So it's hard to paint an LRO with like a single brush because we touch so many different areas. Yeah, obviously, you're the expert here. But I would imagine that the LRO is going to have their fingers in lots of different things. And, you know, my experience as a civil engineering officer was exactly that, that obviously our responsibility was to focus on facilities and the infrastructure that support those facilities that support the mission. Right. But being a CE officer allowed me to go everywhere, touch everything and I would imagine that would be similar for the LRO because everybody, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, needs logistics, just like they need a facility where they can do operations. Exactly. No matter where you're going in the world, somebody has to be able to manifest you on a flight. Well, that's not necessarily the LRO doing that. It's the enlisted career field that the LRO oversees. The LRO still has to know exactly what's going on and be able to understand those processes and guide decision-making if anything were to come up. We also discuss with a lot of different outside organizations, such as civil engineering is another good one. For example, in my current role as the site survey lead, civil engineering is always one of the top priorities that we need to bring with us. We have to know what infrastructure is there, what is needed. We bring our pavement engineers to assess the flight line capability. So it's really a joint effort working with a lot of different organizations. You're obviously going to have even better insight on this, but when we think about the way staffs are organized, you know, the A4 
is the logistics piece of the staff, right? Uh, in fact, it's often called logistics engineering and force protection. And for that reason, it often gets combined with the A7. The A4 slash 7 are typically put together, the 7 being civil engineering facilities, emergency management, those kinds of pieces. Those are often rolled together into logistics and engineering. And so, yeah, the engineers, the civil engineers and the LROs work very closely together, especially in a situation like what you're responsible for is those expeditionary sites. What can those different locations support, not just in terms of logistics, but also facilities? And how do those facilities support the logistics? How do the logistics support the facilities? You know, they go hand in hand so often. And it's a really important thing that I wanted to pull out there for our audience to understand. You're 100% correct on that one. And another good example of that would be like our operations versus infrastructure. So the operations of aircraft refueling, that's going to fall under the LRS, the uh, POL flight, but the actual maintenance of the facilities, such as the pipelines, the pump houses, the above ground tanks, generally falls under civil engineering because it's more of a facility as opposed to an operation. Yeah. So how does someone who is interested in the logistics career field either from an enlisted or from your perspective as an officer, how does someone get into it? Like, what are the things that the career field is looking for in terms of interests, of bachelor's degree requirements, professional certifications, anything like that, that may lend themselves well to getting selected into the career field, into developing along the way? What is it that LROs care about? Sure. Well, it's not necessarily a degree requirement. For example, mine was economics. It's on a high level, the study of supply and demand. So I guess that kind of fits into the mold of what an LRO does. Another uh, good degree option would be supply chain management, but not every LRO has a specific supply related degree. Uh, It's more of uh, looking for people that can think on their feet, make quick decisions, and be able to lead people because ultimately it's our enlisted force that is our subject matter experts. They're the ones that are doing the job every day. You have to be able to lead them and not necessarily be able to do their job for them. That's not really what we're here for. So it's not necessarily a a specific degree requirement we're looking for. It's just more of a uh, type of person that can uh, think well on their feet. So as an LRO, you came from the POL career field Is there an opportunity for you to, you know, go get fuel all over your uniform, you know, go drive a truck around, you know, turn some wrenches on a K-loader or something like that? Possibly. Uh, Generally, they don't trust the officers to touch their equipment as much. I'm sure you guys can relate over there. Uh, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Mostly they'll bring us out to turn wrenches or pick up a shovel or something, mostly because they just want to see us fail. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe that's too harsh of a way to put it. Maybe they just want us to have a greater respect for what it is that the enlisted are doing, you know, how they get so dirty while they're having to pour concrete or construct a building or, you know, the firefighters love to put us through the ringer on their obstacle course or training courses, right? They love to see us sweat. I imagine that there's something similar there within the LRS that the enlisted will want to bring you out so that you can see what they do. You know, they're going to have pride in their career field, right? And so they're going to be excited to show what they're capable of. But there is an opportunity sometimes for the officer to participate in the things that they're doing so that we can gain a better understanding and a feel for what it is that they do. So that when we need to go provide top cover or make a decision for how they're going to be employed, we can do so from a position of actual experience. Totally. Like you said, it's more of having the respect for what they do and having a better understanding of it. They like to bring us out there to show us, but not necessarily to get in the way. So it does give us a better background as to what they do. I feel fortunate that I was prior enlisted in POL, so I have that background. I actually did that for about 10 years. So I do have a decent amount of uh, knowledge retained, not necessarily a subject matter expert knowledge anymore. It's been a good decade. It's been a hot minute. But just having that background has helped me quite a bit. And when you ask if I would have the opportunity to get fuel on me, I think I could make that happen if I wanted to. (laughs) Um, Just given that I had the AFSC for 10 years prior to commissioning kind of helps with that. I miss it. I like it. You know, my people know that I like it. So 
I have that little bit of a connection. And the other example that you mentioned is would I be able to turn wrenches on a K loader? Probably not. That's uh, <laughs> probably a little more technical than what they want their officers doing. Rightfully so. I don't blame them. <laughs> now, it makes sense. You know, they're the technical experts for a reason. We are experts in our own right for a reason. And I think it's important that we recognize and distinguish between the two responsibilities. And as we were just saying, the reason that the officer in this specific instance, the LRO exists is so that you can provide your enlisted airmen with the things that they need, you know, be that organized training and equip, those kinds of things, but also to make decisions for how to use them when operations kick off. You know, how frequently can you get the refueler out there? You know, what does that timeline look like? What is the ability to get cargo or people uploaded or downloaded to a C-17? You, know, you can paint that picture to leadership so that they can have a better understanding of how to operate, make their own plans and make their own decisions for operations stateside as well as downrange. 100%. We have to be able to be there for our people and help them succeed and they help us succeed. It's kind of a uh, joint effort there. So what does the progression of the LRO then look like? You know, obviously you're going to spend some time within the squadron working with fuels, vehicle maintenance, aerial port, moving around the different sections of the squadron, maybe spending some time at the installation deployment cell pushing people down range, but, and we now know that you're at staff. So obviously staff work is a likelihood, a possibility for the LRO, but what else is there? What are the other opportunities and the career progression? What does it look like for the LRO? The typical career progression for an LRO, when you first graduate from tech school and they put you over a flight, you're learning. You are absolutely learning. You first get to your squadron and they do like a ring tour. You spend a week or two with each one of the flights to get a better understanding of what they do. They kind of show you their local processes. And then once you're assigned to your actual flight, you're still in a learning process. Generally, that is going to be the uh, brand new lieutenants. They don't have the experience necessary to really be able to speak intelligently at the career field and make those types of decisions. So it's a learning process. Once you've kind of graduated beyond the learning process, you're kind of taking the reins, kind of running the flight as uh, the best of your abilities as you see the best way to do so. After you kind of progress out of the flight, there's different options within a squadron, such as the DO, the Director of Operations or Operations Officer. There's staff positions, which is where I'm at right now, as well as command opportunities. As I understand it, they're going to follow the typical progression of flight command, director of operations, squadron command, the LRS is within the mission support group. So there's an opportunity to command at the group level. Do you know, are LROs frequently selected for wing commander and above? Is there an opportunity for general officer? There are, but generally the general officer positions, the wing command positions, at least in a flying unit, would be by a rated officer. So if somebody that has flown the aircraft before to take over as wing command, group command is a very good opportunity. Uh, we fall within the mission support group. So sliding into that is a natural progression beyond squadron command. Obviously, there's much fewer group commanders as there would be squadron commands, but it is an option. Is there like a top LRO? Is there a one or a two star you know, for the career field that is considered the logistics readiness officer for the Air Force or something like that? I believe there is. Yeah, there'd be a progression up to that level, but it generally wouldn't flow through wing command. Okay. How about within the guard? Does it mirror active duty? Does it look a little bit different in terms of opportunities for command, for promotion? Is there going to be the similar opportunity for someone to make 06 to be a group commander for the mission support group within the guard? Absolutely. There is that opportunity to make 06 to get to the group command level. And not always, but generally, if you are under the mission support group, you already hold one of the AFSCs. That is a requirement to take that group command is to hold one of the mission support group AFSCs. Logistics being a big part of it. I mean, every AFSC under the MSG is going to interface with logistics somehow. So if you have that background, it's a very strong background to make you a solid candidate for the uh, group command positions. 
Okay. So if I were to summarize the opportunities and experience of the LRO and the career field, there's a huge range of things that you can do, of places you can go, people you'll interact with, again, from fuels to vehicle maintenance, aerial port, maintaining the catalog and the warehouse for all the parts, beans, bullets, and bandages, right, that the operation is going to require. And that's at the squadron level. There's the bigger group level mission, mission support group that you're going to be a part of, interacting very closely with civil engineering. We haven't talked about contracting, but I imagine they're buying all these things that you're storing, right? So there's a relationship there. And then um, beyond that, like what you're doing now, staff, that continues to be the opportunity for you. And all of this can happen anywhere all the time, you know, throughout the globe, right? Logistics is everywhere, right? It is. It's everywhere and it has a hand in everything. Nothing actually happens without logistics. If you can't get your people, your supplies there, your mission is not going to be very successful. Yeah, I think right there is a great place for us to bring in what we've been seeing play out with Russia and Ukraine. You know, the image is seared into my mind and maybe for many other people of a convoy of tanks 40 miles long, stuck for days, can't get anywhere, can't do anything, is just sitting there waiting for the A-10 to show up, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what we understand from that, and you can help us get even greater perspective on it, is because the logistics wasn't available to move that convoy to where it needed to be. Yeah, the Ukrainians were obviously making it difficult for the Russians to move around and get those tanks where they wanted to go. But there were things like they're running out of fuel. The tires and treads on their trucks and tanks were falling off. They didn't have parts. They didn't have food. I mean, if you're going to move a hundred people, obviously there were a lot more than a hundred people, but you know, just to keep the numbers simple, if you're going to move a hundred people that requires a certain number of other people and things to make that movement possible. So having been there, watching that play out in real time, you have a front row seat to it. What are you thinking as a logistics readiness officer, as an LRO are you tearing your hair out? Just like, come on, you guys. Obviously, you, you didn't necessarily want them to, to win, but you're just like, ah, their logistics is terrible. And that's why they're losing. Yeah, absolutely. And I was hoping that you would ask me about this because with the front row seat over here, yes, we, all of us in the logistics community were very well aware of what was happening. But I don't know if it was because they thought they would steamroll Ukraine in a matter of a couple of days and that didn't happen. But it seems like they didn't necessarily plan their resupply very well. They got the tanks in the place, but nothing to support it. The beans, the bullets, the fuel, like they had absolutely nothing and they were just sitting docks. So with the right amount of planning, anything could happen. You can make anything happen. So that's kind of where I wonder, what were they thinking? Was it just a lack of planning or was it a bit of overconfidence? But either way, you have to think of logistics. It's not just getting them there, but it's the resupply. What happens when you run out of fuel? How are you going to be able to continue to refuel your jets? And that's uh, things from the, uh, the logistics community, like our log planners are incredible at thinking ahead at, at stuff like that. And it just didn't seem like over on the other side of the border, it was really happening. Yeah. I mean, it makes me think about this quote and I wish I knew what the actual source was. Maybe you do. Maybe this is a common quote that you all are familiar with. Amateurs talk tactics, but professionals study logistics. Have you heard that before? I have. I should know who said that, but it's escaping me at the moment. But yes, I'm 100% aware of that quote, and it, it couldn't be more accurate. Once you get past that point of what you plan on what you're going to do, you have to determine how you're going to sustain the operations and if you haven't really thought that through, you're going to find yourself in a bind. I think that's what we see on the other side of the border is exactly what happened. We had a episode come out a couple of weeks ago that talked about learning the right lessons from the conflict in Russia, Ukraine, especially the air war. More broadly speaking, we can draw lessons from throughout the conflict. And I think logistics is a really important one is that, and one of the really 
critical lessons that we need to learn is that focusing on equipment and the tactics of how you employ that equipment is an amateur level discussion. If we think about it in terms of this quote, right? But if we're going to really be professional about it, because we are professionals in the profession of arms, we need to elevate the discussion to the logistics level. Like you said, how do you sustain the operation? Not just how do you employ the equipment, the people and their capabilities the one time, but how do you do it again and again and again? And that obviously is going to take logistics to do it. It does. It's almost like chess versus checkers. If you're playing checkers, you're thinking of your next move or if you're playing chess, you need to think more moves ahead. You have to think how your opponent's going to react and then what you're going to do afterwards. So that's going to determine in a real life situation, that's going to determine how you go about resupplying, how much you're going to need and how you're going to get it there. So we have great people over here that uh, that are able to plan all that out and uh, make things happen. So let's think through how does an officer, whether they are an LRO, whether they are a civil engineer, intel officer, or maybe a flyer, how do they think more like a professional instead of a tactician? How do they think long-term? What can the officer of any career field learn from the LRO? From the LRO, I think it is flexibility. Flexibility and always having a backup plan. No matter how you think the correct way to do things are, how it should be done, when it should be done, there might be something that you haven't thought of and it always pays to have a backup plan in case things go awry. So always be flexible and always have a backup plan. And what does flexibility look like to you? Obviously having a backup plan, is that backup plan an alternate version of the primary plan with just a couple of variables changed? Is it something altogether different? Is it a conversation with people that you wouldn't normally talk to coming to find out what other capabilities exist? You know, what are some actionable things that you would want Air Force officers across the board? What are the conversations that you would want them to be having so that they can develop that flexibility? Well, ultimately, the operations are what's going to drive logistics. We don't necessarily drive the operations wherever we're going to put the planes and fly out of. That's what we need to support. So it's important to have that flexibility to where if a base changes or a capability changes, we still need to make the mission happen, regardless of whether plan A is going to happen or you need a plan B. You always have to be flexible because we don't always have control over all these changes. In fact, we seldom ever do, but that doesn't mean that we need to stop supporting. We still have to support. We still have to make the mission happen at the end of the day. Yeah. If anything, this conversation has reignited in me the desire to get to know my fellow LROs and become familiar with the challenges that they are dealing with, understand the capabilities that they bring to the fight and do what I can within my sphere of influence to enable them so that they can enable me. It feels like it, it needs to be a joint partnership, as you've alluded to many times. It does. It goes both ways. So, I mean, LROs can learn a lot from our civil engineering counterparts, as well as other officers across the board. The more contact that we have, and I think that starts off at the young CGO type level. I've seen organizations out there such as like CGO councils that gather up various career fields on base just to have that type of crosstalk, get to know each other. And starting that at a young age, I think, is incredibly important. The more that we know about what each other does and what each other needs in order to be successful, the better we can help each other out and the better off the mission's going to be at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Joe, I think that is a good place to invite the audience to reach out to their fellow LROs if they reach out to their fellow LROs if they're already uh, in the Air Force. If they're not, they want to become more familiar with the career field or if they want to learn more about being in the Guard as an enlisted POL troop or commissioning, you know, if they want to reach out to you for that type of information, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? The best way would probably be email, my government email over the global. I'm in and out TDY quite a bit. So if I give out a phone number, I may or may not be there. So I welcome anybody to reach out with any questions that they have, and I'll be happy to talk with anybody. Awesome. Yeah, so we'll link that in the show notes and greatly encourage anybody 
to reach out to you if they have any questions about the career field or anything else. Well, this has been really fantastic, Joe. We have one final question before we let you go. What does it mean to be an officer? What does it mean to be an officer? That is a good question. For me, being an officer is just being there for my people and being able to lead, being that example that they can follow and being there if they need any help with anything at all. Ultimately, we are not the doers. We're not the hands-on people, but we have to be able to speak intelligently about the career field. We have to be able to lead in that sense. So I think that as far as uh, being an officer, it is uh, just showing that leadership and being the example and empowering our people to lead as well. Awesome. I could not agree more. This has been fantastic to spend the time with you learning about the LRO career field, logistics as a whole, encouraging you and me, as well as everybody else who is listening to this, to be, to not be an amateur, but be a professional, right? Uh, To think in terms of logistics instead of tactics, try to elevate our planning, our perspective, and partnering with other people that are going to help us to do the operation, not just one time, but over and over and over again. How do we sustain things over the long term? Exactly. 100%. That is uh, the entire gist of being a professional is just being able to continually sustain the operation, be flexible, and always have a backup plan. Well, awesome. Major Joseph Strabley, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming out and, and joining us today. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate it. All right. Welcome back, Colin. Awesome, awesome interview. Really learned a ton. You guys both mentioned the DEP program, the delayed entry program. So, yeah, because we had said delayed enlistment program, right? Yeah. And it's actually commonly referred to that. And you'll understand why it almost always applies to members who are enlisting. Once they've committed, you know, they said, I am going to do this until they actually ship out for basic military training. And honestly, it just seems like a tool recruiters have to kind of keep tabs on people. (laughs) So, okay. Yes, it does apply to officers prior to their shipment out to OTS. And yes, I did participate in the delayed entry program. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. As soon as I was announced by the Air Force as selected to attend officer training school, I went down to my local MEP station and I swore in and I signed paperwork, all of which in placed me into the delayed entry program. And it essentially is a way to kind of say, like, I'm really going to do this. Although it says right in the program, you can still not go, like you're not legally bound by anything. You know, if you decide, you know, two days before OTS that you're just not going to do it, you're not in trouble. Yeah. But it does feel pretty serious, though, when you raise your right hand, take the oath of enlistment and like sign paperwork. That feels kind of real. So, yeah, it's a tool to help recruiters kind of keep tabs on people. It allowed me to get on base uh, to allow some of my like trying to get ready stuff. I don't know if that's still the case, you know, work with your recruiter to learn about that. But I will say in my research about this, there is an app built by Air Force Recruiting Service called US Air Force DEP, D-E-P. And it has, you know, I'm looking at it right now. It actually has some really good stuff. It has like countdown until OTS start date. Like you have to pick which class you're selected for. Yeah. It gives you the physical fitness standards and you can take- Wait, you said- countdown to your OTS date. So it's like helping you keep track towards OTS, not BMT. Yeah. When you enter the program, it says, are you going to BMT or are you going to OTS? Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So you pick which program you're entering into, what day your class date is. And then it, no kidding, like there's quizzes and it has quizzes on the Otsman, which this isn't a big, you know, I'm not spoiler alert here or anything. You have to know the Otsman inside and out, the OTS manual, Yeah, and you have to take quizzes on it. And I'm like, I'm passing this Otsman quiz, you know, from like way back when. <laughs> I don't know how current it is, but the point is, this is a really nice little tool. But yeah, the delayed entry program, I did participate in it, and it was very helpful for me. Again, it makes it feel a lot more serious. You know, like, oh, yeah, I've really signed the paperwork. I can tell a landlord, oh, yeah, I've got to leave. Here's my delayed enlistment program. You know, like, I'm going to, I think it's a useful tool. But yeah, I did participate in it. Yeah, that's really cool. Again, that confusion for me was I'm not a OTS product, not a former OTS instructor like you were. And there's not like a delayed enlistment 
thing for Afrazi unless you want to call Afrazi itself a delayed entry program. Almost, yeah, almost. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Another thing, because I was at OTS as an instructor, that's a total force unit. So we have instructors that are guard, reserve, and active duty. I really loved interacting with my fellow guardsmen because I hadn't really interacted much with the guard. And I would say 25% of the instructors there when I was there were a part of the guard. Wow, that seems like a high number. Well, they form a big portion of the overall force structure. And in the summer, we have a massive influx of reserve instructors. So anyway, it's a really cool interaction there. And I learned a little bit about their recruiting process. Okay. And you guys kind of mentioned the interview process and the board process. And you asked Joseph, you know, how specific his process was to his guard unit. And again, not having gone through the process myself, but talking to multiple officers and having these things confirmed by multiple members of the guard, each guard unit's recruiting process is very specific to that unit. I've heard and had confirmed by multiple sources that many will have, you know, part, they want to know, like, do you know what the state bird is? Do you know what the state flower is? You know, these are things they want because you're interviewing for a guard unit, which has responsibilities to the state and the governor in that state. They want to know that you know the state, that you have some sort of allegiance, that you you understand what it is to be a member of the Utah Air National Guard or yeah. whatever organization you're trying to get into. I spoke to someone who said that a big part of joining their guard unit was softball. They would ask what position you played in <laughs> softball because that was a big part of their unit. So I don't know. I mean, there's so many units out there, but just know the recruiting process will be very specific to that organization. Yeah. And while you're describing this and bringing in the piece of information that we so often hear that getting into a guard unit is like, you know, trying to like rush the club, you know, you're trying to join a family as opposed to a friend's group, right? And it's really difficult to get in, especially as an officer, because they're more likely to recruit from if within than from you know, somebody who just you know, comes in off the street and says, hey, I want to fly your airplane. And they're like, yeah, so does everybody else, right? Yeah. And a huge percentage of my students that were commissioning into the Guard were enlisted in the same units they were becoming an officer in. Yeah. And if what you're saying is true, that the recruiting process is very specific to the unit and they're going to try to prove your, I guess, devotion, your commitment to that unit and to the state that that unit supports, it makes sense that that would be the case because it's the easiest way to vet people who meet those requirements, right? To select people from among those who are there already doing that thing. And so it makes sense in my mind that that would be why getting into a guard unit, especially as an officer, is most likely going to happen in that type of way. Yeah. And again, I'm not a member of the National Guard, but just having worked with them so closely, you know, for a couple of years, certainly gained an appreciation for what they do. And Again, anecdotal, but confirmed by multiple independent sources. So there we go. Yeah. So something here that I wanted to talk about, Reed, is that relationship between the enlisted and the officer. You know, so many of the enlisted that come into a guard unit, but really just in general, you know, in for active duty and the reserve as well, the relationship between the enlisted who want to become officers. And then what is it like as an officer what is the ongoing relationship like? And we got into this a little bit in the interview when we were talking about, since Joe is a former POL troop, fuel troop, that he could go do those same things with the enlisted folks or going down to the vehicle maintenance area and working on the K loader with the enlisted there and getting his uniform dirty, right? So I want to talk about what that relationship is like. And what we were discussing is very familiar to me as a civil engineering officer, where the opportunity for us to go and do something with the enlisted is actually very much encouraged and very probable, very easy to do, quote, easy to do, right? Because they're always out there in the field, digging holes, fixing pipes, 
doing construction work for concrete or carpentry or something along those lines, or going out with the firefighters or doing a controlled detonation with EOD or doing sea burn training with the emergency managers. You know, civil engineering has 11 different AFSCs. And so there's lots of opportunity for us to get out there and get dirty with the enlisted. That seems to be the case with the logistics readiness career field, the squadron there for those officers to go out and get dirty with their enlisted airmen, right? And that's a really important part of what we do as officers because it develops that respect for what they do. It develops our understanding of what this squadron as a whole is capable of, but more specifically, each career field and the demands that are placed on them and the effects that they can achieve. Because I'm not an operator, I don't know what that opportunity looks like on the operations side. And so I wanted to bring it up here for you to speak to that side of things. You know, how often is the Intel officer going to be able to sit down with their 1NO, the analyst, and be able to, quote, analyze some Intel? What does that look like? Yeah. And I love this whole discussion. And I was absolutely thinking of that as Major Stravely was talking about, you know, could you go and do POL stuff with the POL troops since you came from that? And I love this idea. It's not as common as it should be. So in Intel, there are six basic like core enlisted AFSCs. And within many of those, there are shreds. So just in like, say the one and two, the signals analyst, you have alphas and Charlies. An alpha cannot do a Charlie's job and a Charlie cannot do an alpha's job. So, you know, there are, if you take all the shreds, you know, we're probably approaching 10 different AFSCs. And each of those has a very rigorous training pipeline. And, you know, the equivalent of a six month tech school plus additional follow-on training. So it's pretty uncommon unless an officer came from the enlisted for an officer to be qualified enough doing the enlisted's jobs to really engage with them at their level because they're just so much better at it than you are. And he described that in LRO tech school. You just kind of, he said, a mile wide and an inch deep. And I'm like, and I'm just nodding my head. I'm like, yep, that is it. (laughs) This is an image you have imagery analysts next. (laughs) And, you know, that's their entire focus and they're extremely good at what they do. But I think it's super important to, quote, get dirty and get your hands involved in what they do. If for nothing else, for you to gain an appreciation like you described and to also show to your folks that you value what they do, that you care enough to learn about it so that you can OT and E. So you can organize, train, and equip. Yeah. That's, I think, the biggest thing that we need to do, especially as operators, is to be able to, we make decisions that impact their lives. Right. And if you can't even understand at all what it is they do, you're not going to have the credibility with them. They're not going to respect your decisions. But if you can sit down with them and gain a deeper appreciation about what they do, not so that you can do it or do it better, that's not it. Right. It's so that they can understand, hey, this officer is making decisions, but they came and they sat down with me for three or four hours yesterday to understand what it is that's going on here. They will give you their leadership, their followership more than they would if you just sit on your ivory tower and command by email. Yeah. Don't do that. (laughs) No, absolutely. Yeah. That is absolutely the critical reason for the officer to go and spend some time with their enlisted. But I also want to bring the other side of it into this, right? That it is the opportunity for the enlisted to gain an appreciation for what it is that the officer brings to the fight, right? That they can get a feel for what sort of things you care about, the questions that you're asking, the gaps in your knowledge, the alternative perspective that you bring that maybe that they hadn't considered before, because just like you don't get to do what they do, they don't get to do what you do. And I think that there's a whole lot of synergy that can be captured there. It doesn't have to be the three to four hours, like you said, that would be great. But just, you know, the 15 minutes or even just like the five minute conversation 
when you go to the enlisted to ask for a product, don't just ask for the product, but have a conversation about the product, what it takes to create the product, how the product is going to be used to enable the operation and, and the effect that it hopefully will achieve. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. Perfect example. Have some of your enlisted folks come to staff meeting every once in a while. 100%. That is a recurring meeting in almost every organization I've been a part of. The entire squadron doesn't go to staff meeting. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Every once in a while, especially like you said, if you've had someone work on something, allow them to come to the thing where it's going to be presented so they can understand and see the purpose and intent. Yeah, 100%. And so, Reed, this actually leads me to my next point, where we talked a little bit about the higher headquarters staff, and I want to draw that kind of that same relationship and conclusion with the higher headquarters and what's happening at the squadron. So often, there seems like there's this huge divide between what the staff does and what the squadron does. And... We should try to close that gap by spending time with each other, right? Now, I recognize that it's not always going to be possible for you, the point of contact at the squadron for a particular RFI or product or you know, a, a tasker that the higher headquarters needs for you to then you know, fly to Scott Air Force Base and spend some time at AMC. Right. I don't know that that's always going to be the case, but we can try to replicate it in principle in that the staff can communicate down to the squadron. This is how this product is going to be used to inform a commander, build a plan, allow some decisions to be made. And same thing on going the other direction, that the squadron can bring people from the staff quote down to their level, right? And show them this is what we're dealing with. This is what it takes to produce that product and try to get after this gap that so often exists between what's happening on the ground versus what's there at the staff. Yeah. And it is so important. This was my daily life when I was at the 613th Air Operations Center at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Because the AOC is functionally aligned under, and we'll talk about this in a moment, A3 operations. Yeah. Right? And during a exercise or a conflict, it immediately starts to report directly to the four-star, the Joint Force Air Component Commander, the commander of Pacific Air Forces. So we report to the A3, but... In wartime, we're tasked directly by the commander of PACAF, but there's an Intel air staff, the A2, right? and they do Intel things. Well, they've got this massive organization over at the AOC doing Intel who reports directly to their boss, but they don't have any say in how that goes. A2s don't tend to like that. You know, they, <laughs> they kind of want to get their fingers in. And so I don't think any staff likes to have like their thing taken away from them they, and they want to touch everything. <laughs> yeah. And so, and we'll talk about the, again, the structure, but this was my daily life. Well, the A3 said, well, the A2 said, I'm like, well, I report to the A3 uh, anyway. Yes. Yeah. And Colin, this is the job of a CGO. Oh man, this is an action officer thing. If you can get over the fact that some captain emailed you from staff and need something, if you can just like shelve your initial reaction and connect with them, it's going to be at the action officer level where you can smooth all these things over. Yes, I know their boss might be a three-star. And yes, you've got to get it done quickly. But this is where like the little minions can actually have a massive amount of power is if they can like shelve their emotions and work together and connect with people. So yeah, why don't we run down kind of like the structure and how you'll typically interact with them because I think it'll put it, it all in context. Yeah, so I'm just going to quickly go through the list you know, A1 through A9 to give us all the idea of what the different functions are and what they cover. And then you and I can talk to the different staffs that we interact with most frequently and draw some conclusions there, right? Yeah. So A1 is manpower and personnel. A2, intelligence. A3, 
operations, A4, logistics, A5, plans, exercises, training a little bit, A6, communications, A7, installations, mission support facilities, A8 is strategic plans and programs, which is not the same thing as A5 plans. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. And then A9 is analysis, assessments, lessons learned, trying to capture what the rest of the staffs are learning. Real quick before we go on, Colin, this staff structure exists across the services and at the joint level. Right. So if you are talking to a member of the Army and they say G2, I know that that's ground, G, Army, and Intel. This number structure exists across the services. The J3 is at the joint level operations. Yeah, this structure applies across the DOD, and you got to know how this works. Yeah, well, and we actually get these numbers, though this organization from the Army. They're the ones that developed it, and they actually run it at the battalion level. Yeah. You know, they have a battalion S2 that's in charge of Intel or, or an S3 that's in charge of ops or S6 that does comm. And the Air Force is moving the direction of pushing the A staff organization down to the wing level. So gone will be the typical wing staff structure that has existed previously where they have a wing safety office and the comptroller and you know, plans and programs and those kinds of things. You know, they're going to be shifted around and fall under an A1, an A2, A3, and so on and so forth. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's such a useful structure. I'm glad to see it coming down. And we've seen that at in our wing. We've seen those hints kind of trickling out. It's happening. And Colin, like you said, each of us in your different AFSCs and your different career fields, your different functions, you tend to interact with different parts of this. As you know, an operations guy, I have dealt with the A3 quite a bit. I already talked about that when I was at the AOC. And also with the A2, that is my knowledge set. At headquarters Air Force, they've actually combined the A2 and the A6 into a single headquarters element because of the convergence of cyber and intel. Yeah. So the six refers to communications, but communications are going to most frequently occur in the cyber domain. And well, what else happens in the cyber domain? Well, Intel does. And so you can see the convergence there. Yep. Another one you mentioned, Colin, is plans and programs and strategic plans and programs. I've almost always seen those as A58. Yeah. You know, A5 slash 8, because they've just kind of converged those planning functions. Yeah. And other things that frequently get combined are the A4 slash the 7, which is the mission support, you know, because logistics and mission support almost invariably go together. It's very rare that a logistics plan is not going to also require some sort of facility you know, from the civil engineering side of things. And so you can see how the, those two will play together quite frequently. Yeah. You got to know how these staffs work, how this organization, how this structure works. And it's a good idea wherever you are, just go up your chain of command, think about your function, and pretty quickly you'll be able to find, you know, what headquarters element, what staff element kind of runs your organization at the headquarters level. You know, I heard this once from a two star and it was the first time I'd heard this, but it was really helpful for me to understand. You know, when you think about leadership, you think organize, train and equip. Yeah. When you start talking Pentagon staff level, it's policy and oversight and guidance. Yeah. You know, so they are the ones and money. Yeah, it's always about the money. <laughs> um, however, this idea of organized training and equip is still kind of tactical if you think about it. Yeah, these are the folks deciding. You know, do we need our officers to have bachelor's degrees? That's going to happen at no. a one. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but that kind of decision making, that kind of discussion, is happening in the halls of the Pentagon at a one. Yeah, and so. At your level, you need to understand what it is that your role is. And very often, I call on you and I fall into this trap all the time. We'll start talking about things and solving the world's problems without taking notes around the water cooler. And you need to realize, like, that is a staff job. That is way far from you. 
but understanding where that staff function happens can help you maybe influence that process. Yeah. So if you are of the mind that officers should not need bachelor's degrees, you have a point of contact, you have an office that you know will make that decision where you can flow that idea to, or you can reach out to and get some feedback on your idea. You know, it doesn't take too much effort to find a fellow CGO that's working in with one of those staffs that you can get in contact with, especially with how connected we are now with social media and within the Microsoft environment where it's, you can literally look anybody up. It's not that hard for you to reach out to the CGO at A1H, which does you know, officer development, and you can suggest to them, hey, what if we got rid of the bachelor's degree? And you can have that conversation. Maybe it's something that they have already been talking about and they've been developing, you know, that they've already pitched this three-year transition plan to all of the four stars and it's been bought off on and it just hasn't been announced yet. Or maybe they've never thought of it before. And they're like, hey, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll, we'll have a conversation about it. You can close the gap between you at the squadron and what you're doing there and what's happening at the higher headquarters. It's not that hard. And it's that critical for those conversations to take place. Yeah. And very often these staff elements will have like an idea box mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, they want to hear. So, but yeah, really important to understand how those staff functions work. And let's wrap this up here by saying what is going to be the result of closing the gap between the enlisted and the officer, the squadron and the higher headquarters staff. This is how I believe we are going to move from the amateurish discussion of tactics and into that professional discussion around quote logistics. Just say logistics because that's what that quote is, but just the professional level discussion period, right? How do we elevate the discussions that we are having? It's by doing this very specific thing is getting to know what's happening at the lower levels, getting to know what's happening at the higher levels, and trying to find the commonalities, the differences, capture that synergy so that we can really get after the issues that are facing us. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, you know, you brought up that quote, Colin. You guys talked about it in the interview. I hate finding quotes <laughs> and proving quotes in the day of the internet. It's just, it's so frustrating because... Again, being an Intel guy, I want to know sources, right? Like I want to know that, you know, I found this quote was most often cited as being from former five-star general Omar Bradley. Yes, five stars is a thing. Look it up. But I couldn't find an actual reference material. But if you just Google who said, and then insert quote here, you'll just find dozens upon dozens of quote pages. Yeah. And all they do is they just have a name. And you're like, okay, but like in what setting? Is there a yeah. book that I can go check out at the library where I can find it on page 27, paragraph three? You know, like, can I actually see attributable information? Anyway, I hate finding references for quotes in the modern era. You're talking like an Intel guy. I know. Sorry, I can't tuck <laughs> it in sometimes. I saw it referenced to another Marine Corps general, Robert Barrow, in a newspaper article in 1972, but I couldn't find that that was actual a newspaper or not. Anyway, the point is, there's so many truth bombs in that little quote. Amateurs discuss tactics, professionals discuss logistics. Yeah. Because it's absolutely true. And, and like you said at the header, you know, we've seen that play out in the Russia Ukraine conflict. Russia has looked amateurish because of logistics. Now, whether it's they didn't plan the right kind or they didn't plan them at all, that may be something we won't ever know. But like you described in the interview, seeing a 40 mile long convoy of heavy materiel just sitting there is not a good look. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and you're not going to win <laughs> if that's how things are playing out. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, last thing for me, Colin, I really enjoyed the interview with Joseph. I could not help but think this guy's going to make a bajillion dollars someday. <laughs> and why do I say that? First, he studied economics and now he's a logistician in the United States military, widely regarded as the pinnacle of logistics. Yeah. Because we have to move crazy stuff in crazy quantities in incredible speeds to crazy places. Yeah. So 
just to put this in context a little bit and what I'm getting at, if you have ever bought something online, you have been involved in logistics. Heck, if you've ever bought anything ever. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah, but just contemplate for a minute. I live in Dayton, Ohio. I can go right now, like a mile away, and buy lemons. (laughs) It's June right now when we're recording. I don't know what the harvest, I don't know what the temperatures are like where you are in Southern California. You might actually be able to grow lemons in Southern California. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. Yeah, you certainly can't grow lemons in Dayton, Ohio. I'm going to be in Canada next week, and I bet I can do the same thing. I bet I can go to a grocery store and find lemons. And I bet I could find them in December. That's logistics, right? Somebody somehow figured out how to get fresh lemons from wherever they're growing in tropical city, wherever, to the middle of Canada in December. That's logistics. And I mean, just think of the companies. Amazon, FedEx, anything to do with oil and gas, and just the number of employment opportunities for someone with an economics major and experience in logistics, he's going to be doing fine. I'm sure he's going to be doing fine. Yeah, absolutely. The opportunities with an Amazon, a Walmart, Target, FedEx, UPS, you know, any of these companies, but bigger picture Kind of like what Joe was saying in the interview about the logistics officer being someone who is flexible, informed, able to make decisions. What company doesn't want somebody who can do that? Exactly. And to have demonstrated the ability to do that over and over and over again. Yeah. Under difficult circumstances. I mean, yes, they do logistics when people are trying to kill them. (laughs) I shouldn't laugh at that. I know, but but that's kind of the absurdity of the business we're in. And I thought Major Strabley did an awesome job highlighting just this vast and impressive career field. I really got a lot out of the interview. I appreciate all the work it took to get that arranged and for you guys to conduct that. So I really appreciate you guys making that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, shout out to the USAFE A4 staff. They picked him specifically. Like of all the people that they are connected to, They said, this is the guy that we want to have represent us. I think he just knocked it out of the park. Great representative of his career field, of the staff there, and what they're trying to do, USAFE and UCOM, and the Air Force and the military as a whole. A fantastic human being, Major Joe Strabley. Big thanks to him for joining us here on the podcast. Anything else that you want to leave the audience with? Nope, that'll do it today. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed. 